Hello, Mary. Hello, lovely to see you. Oh. Hello, Hello, Katie. So good to see you. Yeah, it's really lovely to see you today. And um, we've got another program here, Katie and Mary Presents. Um, and we'll, for those people that have just joined us, please click the subscribe button so we can alert you to more of these sessions and um, episodes. And today we've got some live music for you. We've got a great discussion about some very interesting characters. But before we do that, we'll just introduce ourselves briefly for those of you who've joined and don't know who we are. So I'm Katie Carr, I'm a British songwriter with Polish roots. And my last trilogy of albums, um, Pashport, here it is, um, Pashport, Pashport, um, Polonia and Providence have been inspired by the Second World War experience in Poland. And there are 50 songs that I've written. And through my music, I was able to meet the lovely Mary Skinner from New York in America. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Mary, um, to introduce yourself. Thanks. I, I'm uh, Mary Skinner. I'm a filmmaker and the subject of one of my most precious films was Irena Sendler, whose photo is behind, painting is behind me. And uh, this film was made in 2011 in several languages. And uh, it's been uh, broadcast and available ever since. And uh, it tells the story of Irena Sendler, who is a Polish uh, World War II heroine who organized the rescue of hundreds and hundreds of Jewish children from the Warsaw Ghetto. And since this week, we're, we're celebrating uh, in the United States, uh, Holocaust Remembrance. Katie and I thought it might be a good idea to uh, tell you more about some of those other women. So in the next three or four episodes, we'll be talking about the different kinds of women who were helping Irena Sendler in this organized conspiracy. Some of them are in my film, and the ones that are in my film are emblematic of many, many others. They were angry teenagers, they were social activists, they were women of faith, and they were artists and seductresses. So today we're going to be talking about the angry teenage girls who, the mighty girls who were part of Irena Sendler's initiatives to save those children. And one in particular was a woman who was in my film, and her name was Magda Rusinik Korotska, Korotskowska. She, she uh, was still living in Warsaw uh, until only recently. And actually, Katie, you had a chance to meet her, right? I did. I was very privileged to be able to meet her in Warsaw. This was a, a few years back now, and um, I had a lovely exchange with her. She was quite elderly when I went to visit her, so um, meeting her was a great privilege, and I was really honoured. And I had a lovely conversation with her about her experience during the Second World War, and um, just a really interesting history because she had helped Irena Sendler with saving these children, you know, thousands of children they saved together. And um, the wonderful thing about Magda is that she was helping the children to pass as Catholic children, just pass as Polish Catholic children. When she got to her age of 82 at that time, she discovered that she had been Jewish all the way through her life and um, she is in Yad Vashem now but she started to learn about her Jewish ancestry at such a late age and so I talked to her about that and I also asked her about her role as a resistance fighter in the Second World War and she was in the criminal court of the Polish Home Army and if people don't know much about this was the largest allied resistance 
um, the Polish resistance was the largest in the Second World War in Europe and across the world, I believe. And they had many, many different layers to this uh, Polish Home Army. They had underground universities, underground court systems, huge um, factions. We, we talked about um, Zhigota, the, the um, Department for Saving Jewish Lives in our last series. Um, but the most amazing um, quote that Magda gave me was that she um, she said to me, I said to her, what what did you, do you remember singing any songs in the Second World War? And she said, I didn't sing, I just shot. <laughs> so it was, it was a very fascinating meeting. I'll, I'll pass it back to very you. Typical. typical of her. Uh, so the thing about Magda is that uh, she was just turning 14 or 15 when the war began and she and her, her father was very, uh, um, he was a minister in Krakow, so the family was very well to do and she uh, had been very well educated and spoke several languages and she'd even been sent abroad to the UK to study for a while as a young girl, so she, she knew um, languages she and she knew sports she was very athletic uh, and so when the war began all of that was cut short and she like that whole generation of teenagers was just furious and couldn't wait she in particular couldn't wait to become part of some kind of resistance and at one point i asked her you know what were you thinking why what made you feel so bold that uh, uh, because she actually took the oath, you know, she was um, enrolled by the officers of the underground army and they told her first she's going, you know, if she's caught, she will be tortured and then she will be killed. And, uh, and I said, didn't that intimidate you? And she said, no, because I thought I was going to die anyway. We all thought we were going to die. And she said, at that moment in my life, I made my own oath that I would do everything I could to defy Hitler. And so she was extremely bold. And this is how these young girls were. And many of them were, were running missions for Irena Sundler and the senior uh, women in this uh, underground conspiracy. And they really didn't know who they were working for. They didn't know what they were doing because everything was given to them in code. So they simply were told, go to such and such street and pick up a message or go to such and such street and pick up a package. And package usually was the underground code for an infant that had been smuggled out of the ghetto. And the job of these courier or young teenage liaisons was to do the, do the mission and, and, and report back that it had been a, a accomplished. But often they didn't know who they were doing it for and they didn't know much else about the mission. So um, Magda and a very good friend of hers uh, who was about the same age, they were both part of this underground university, which they called flying universities at that time. It was the only way that if you were Polish, you could continue with your education, was to meet in secret with your teachers and professors in small um, apartments or around a kitchen table. And so she and her girlfriend, Hannah, um, were studying together and Hannah's mother had been one of these women that uh, I talked about in last week. She had been a seamstress for the theater and she had uh, an apartment which was very close to the ghetto. And uh, all during the pre-war period, she had many, many Jewish friends and she was very active in the theater. And so when the war began, she immediately uh, took all her fabric and she made these beautiful curtains and she hung them uh, from the rafters of her apartment and made little rooms. And these rooms were for Jews who were fleeing the ghetto uh, to escape into hiding on the um, uh, Polish side of the ghetto wall. And it's so touching that she thought that 
they would want privacy. So she made these uh, dividing curtains for each family. And so this, um, her apartment all during the war was known as the hotel under God's wing, the hotel under the rafters, the hotel under God's wing. I mean, it's and, incredible that yeah. these, um, these young women, because we're talking about Magda, she was 17 years old. How, how old was um, uh, Anya? Anna. Mm -hmm. About the same age. And Hana, Hana, I interviewed Hana, and she didn't want to be interviewed on camera, but she told me a lot about how they operated. And she said, you know, what would happen is that Irena Sundler's co-worker, Yad Viga, would call her mother and say, there's two people running, you know, they're escaping. Can they stay with you for the night? And of course, Hana's mother would let them in and they would get, be given one of these little rooms. And often there were children uh, and they would call and they would say, can one of the girls go get the child? So uh, Magda would be given a mission, like get the child and the child has got to live on the Aryan side of the ghetto. And he's been in, he's been living in impoverished conditions and he hasn't had any sons. So go to the Vistula and sit with him on the sand and let him get some sun, you know, uh, so he looks a little tan and a little healthy. So they were and, really, really uh, willing to risk their own lives to for the good of other people and where does that come from mary i mean it's not just about being an angry teenager i mean this is probably to do with again if we we, we return back to uh, 1918 um poland had re-established itself as an independent state it finally got its country back having had its land stolen by three aggressors russia prussia and the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And the young people had been born in a free Poland. The young people represented those very um, incredible energies that you require with regards keeping their culture alive, keeping their language alive. They had obviously heard from their families about the time before where you were forbidden to talk Polish and everyone was cooperating contrary to the history books that have been written about poland absolutely and and you, and you someone, yeah, yeah and someone like magda came from this uh, her father was a minister of parliament so very patriotic family and of course he was immediately sent away and then her mother got very very sick and so magda was trying to care for her mother her mother eventually died but both she and her sister immediately joined up with the resistance. It was the only thing to do, you know, it was, and, and they were so furious, they were just furious that their future had been taken away from them. Yeah, because so, um, I think people don't really understand that when the Germans attacked, the Soviets did as well. A lot of people mm -hmm. are unfamiliar with the fact of the Soviet invasion on the 17th of September 1939. A lot of people know about the German invasion, but which meant that Poland was enslaved between the two superpowers and the effects of the nation were horror and brutality and people being shot on the street or rounded up as we heard about your 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 mother your own mother was rounded up in one of these horror horrific um occasions and um so these these young people were really running on adrenaline and very little food and would, were really risking their lives it's it's not um it wasn't uh, a pleasant situation if you hit a jewish person you were shot on the spot um it's the only country poland was the only country where you hid a jewish person it was very it was extremely risky and magda had many many episodes where she would be on a, a tram with a jewish child and they would stop the tram and ask everybody to get off which often happened one of the or they'd get caught in a what they called a wampanki you know a street roundup where just uh a, without any reason without any justification two or three, you know people were rounded up and sent off to uh concentration camps so she was constantly taking these risks and, and the other thing that's really interesting is that you know their mothers allowed them to do this uh and i'm sure that the mothers were terrified i think about my own grandmother and I had this sneaking suspicion that my mother was on some kind of a mission and she didn't really know it. And 
that her my grandmother sent her out to do something and she never came back but um this was one of the reasons why it was uh irena sendler who had the top role in the underground conspiracy to save children because she didn't yet have children she was taking care of her mother but there there was a, a woman who was was playing that role before her who had children and the organization was too worried about having a woman with children in that top leadership role because they knew that would be what the Nazis would do. They would use the children as hostages. They would take the children as hostages. And there the is a story, of the of a, a horrible the story of a, a leading underground uh, a woman in the underground who was a top leader and she was tortured in Paviak prison and when she wouldn't uh, divulge the names or any of the secrets or places or uh, any of gave them any more information than what they wanted, they brought her 15 year old son, 17 year old daughter and shot them right in front of her. So this is how far they would go. So you have these mothers taking these risks, but you have these angry teenagers willing to do anything. And there's such a, in some ways, there's such a role model for young people today, not, not that yeah, we, we should encourage teenagers to go out and risk their lives, but just the single mindedness of, of this group of people, they were so determined to get their education, they thought, you know, they, they, it's not as if you had to force them to go to school, they had to break the law to go to school. Yes, they had to break the law to eat, they had to break the law to get medical help they had to break the law to help another person and they were willing to do all of that and you see that energy in ukraine today well you know, yes and, and, the and you see it you see it there and i just want to come back to the fact that you know it wasn't just jewish children they were saving because the germans were stealing children from poland and sending them on their exactly. own exactly um to germany a thousand i mean we're talking like maybe 500,000 children. I don't even know actually the, the total number. Somebody said to me that's nearly a million children were stolen from Poland during the Second World War. Babies who were sent to be raised as Germans um, and Germanized. And now those people are in Germany currently, maybe 80 years old, and have no way of finding their families because they were stolen. And and the the Germans had um annihilated all of the and, and burnt all or, or blocked every single piece of information to find where these people come so a lot of people wandering around germany who are the product of this theft of children um and the thing is with the with the jewish mothers who were get, it must have been such a terrifying thing to give your little baby or your to the trust of a polish woman not knowing if it was going to survive the war and the heartbreak of actually having to let that child go sometimes they had the, they had to drug the child to keep it quiet put it in a box and take it to um to to safety but to but um irena had a, an incredible system didn't she she had a jar and she had lots and lots of pieces of paper with the children's names and and the and where they came from didn't she well they were all um all the women who were working in the conspiracy were very uh conscientious conscious of how important it would be to return those children to their biological parents after the war. So they were all keeping records, but they were keeping records for a variety of reasons. Probably the most important was um, so that somehow the child's original identity could be determined after the war. But uh, they were also keeping records because they needed to give them to the leaders of the uh, the organization in order to get more stipends to pay the foster families who were feeding these children, taking care of these children. And uh, the other thing is that it's often because there was Schindler's list, a lot of people have confused uh, the notion of having one list. It's, there was no one list that would have been extremely dangerous to have one list with all these names. 
there were various ways in which all of the women were retaining records and they all knew that after the war they would get together and they would compile them and they would do their very best to put these children back with their biological families. But often the children who were rescued from the ghetto, many of them were infants who had just been left, you know, their parents had been de deported. Or they, uh, or, or they were starving on the streets of the of the ghetto, and no one knew who their parents were. So what would and have happened so... to these children if these young teenagers and these and Irena and her team hadn't stepped in? What would have happened to those children? They all would have died. They, they would have died have because died. they had no caregivers. Yeah. They, there was no way. There was no hope for these children so no so, hope at all they would have and 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 and, and arena knew and her co co-workers knew they were very very aware that they were doing what they could to save the last remnant of jewish civilization in warsaw that's how uh how brutal this these deportations were how genocidal these actions were the Nazis were determined to get rid of everyone, and they were saving this remnant. And so, the, and when they saved the, that the people would survive. So, when they saved this remnant, you can often see it in the faces of Polish people. A lot of Polish people do look a little bit, um, you know, of a certain. That there are some certain characteristics, you know, dark hair, dark heart, you know, dark eyes, and lots of different cultural um, crossovers there over the generations. I mean, you know, the classic thing with Poles is that they have blonde hair because it obviously Sweden invaded um, many centuries ago and and had left a gene pool there. But there is certainly a Jewish gene pool that is living and the DNA continues and the legacy continues of that connection. And I think that's fascinating. Yeah, you know, very much, but you know, the, the, uh, when Stalin took over in Poland, you know, there was, especially in those early years, you, you know, it was not going to be, uh, there was no devout Catholicism allowed. There was no devout Judaism allowed. Everybody was supposed to be under one. So if you were Jewish, you know, you probably, um, a lot, there were, there's no question but that uh, there were many people of Jewish origin who chose uh, sort of a secular life just to make things palatable, to make things easier. Uh, as were, there were many pe people who had formerly been devout Catholics, just chose a secular life. Um, and, and then there were children who were hidden who never did find their Jewish parents and never did know that they were in fact taken from the ghetto and that they were Jewish. And those people are, are, are just now um, beginning to learn of their Jewish roots. And they're going back to the, the rabbi in Warsaw and they're asking to study, just like Magda, you know, a lot of the popular, big part, portion of the population, you have to imagine in a city like Warsaw, 30 or 40% of the population in certain years was Jewish. So there was a lot of intermingling and, uh, you know, it's a very diverse, diverse, uh, population in the cities especially so i have some many fans. many people yeah i have some fans of my music that have written to me due to some of the songs that i've written and they are saying that this is a you know my music is a platform for them to have that chance to feel um a, a connection with the past and a connection to what they perceive could be their gene pool there's a lot of ambiguity about where people come from in poland because so much was but you know so many papers were burnt by the germans at the end of the war so many photos obviously any photos were probably absolutely confiscated and burnt and destroyed a big um you know everything everything connected with jewish life was burned in poland regardless of the concentration and, 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 and the german both the germans and the russians wanted to get rid of being polish too so yeah. you know uh, for, this, the, for the germans 100 percent of poland was to be for ethnic germans yeah and poles were to be a slave class that eventually died out for the russians the same you know it should be a place where they could repatriate uh, their 
you know, indoctrinated communist peoples and uh, anybody who was uh, against the program was taken away and interred in a in the gulag. So a lot of the information um, has been um, appropriated post Second World War because those people who experienced the Second World War were unable to either have witnesses or say that they saved Jewish lives because the amount of anti-Semitism created from the Soviet Union post Second World War, so Stalinism and communism were completely anti-Semitic, which is why so many Jewish people had to leave in the 60s because the amount, because it, it celebrate, you know, this, this totalitarian regime of the Cold War regime celebrated anti-Semitism. And that's a, that's a, and the, the history that the West has learned about Poland has been re, 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 rewritten so many times that it's almost, it's, it's, it has to be written in the right way so that the people who deserve to be remembered should be remembered in a, in a dignified and honorable way. Unfortunately, um, a lot of the people had to go underground during the Cold War and, and not talk about their experiences for fear of being um, deported to a Stalinist concentration camp, a gulag in Siberia. Many people were resent to Siberia. It was a reign of horror for 50 years. And, yeah, uh, and you know, it was also it was also very much you you get the feeling that this is going on in Russia and parts of Ukraine mm -hmm. as well. You know, populations were pitted against each other because that works for a dictator. It works for a dictator to keep people beating to be keep people hating each other. And so, uh, uh, you know, people were afraid. People people were generally afraid, afraid to say who they really were, afraid to say much, you know, there wasn't much, you wanted to stay alive, you go with the program. And yeah, but the Poland, economy um, was busted and uh, mm -hmm. there was, you know, not, not enough opportunity, not enough food, not enough uh, housing, <laughs> not enough of anything. So people were very quiet during that period. It's not as if uh, they were quiet because Polish people were making them be quiet or because Belarusians were making them be quiet or because Russians were making them be quiet. They were quiet because they were under the dominion of this ruthless dictator, Stalin. Mm -hmm. That was the and Cold War. But during the Second World War, where these angry teenagers were, it all came down to the Molotov-Ribbentrop Agreement, which was signed seven days prior to the beginning of the Second World War. And a lot of people don't know about the Devil's Alliance, the Hitler-Stalin Pact, that was signed between Germany and Russia, the Soviet Union to enslave and steal Poland. And we see this now in Ukraine. I think that's why people of Polish descent really do understand about Russian aggression. Um, it's just uh, that the Russian uh, outlets and, and as you can see, the appropriation of news, news speak, everything that George Orwell spoke about in his book 1984, which he was inspired by the Polish emigre. Um, you can see that in actual time now with, um, with the dictator that's currently in charge, the, the top KGB agent of the world, which I will not really want to mention his name because he doesn't deserve to be mentioned at this point. Um, but we do understand and we we do stand with Ukraine on on fighting for their freedom, on keeping their culture alive and the right to be spiritually uh, um, and religiously able to pray in the way they want to pray. They do not need to have their country stolen at all and um, the aggressor needs to leave that country. But unfortunately during the Second World War Polish people didn't have the option. They were unable to leave the enslavement and they were slaves. Every single Polish person in Poland during the Second World War was a slave to Germany, or to Stalin, and there were no possibilities for any cooperation.
everybody was a slave and the character of the Polish uh, character was very strong in the resistance. Um, so we're wrapping it up now. Um, Mary, is there any... You have a song which has been circulating on the web and it, it's all about this uh, experience that Ma Magda was furious about, which is uh, losing her country, losing her passport, losing her possibilities to grow up to be, to become a married and to have a family and to speak her own language and the country of her that was her homeland, all of this being ripped from out under her. And this song that you have sort of get characterizes that experience so beautifully. So would you please sing it for us? Yes, I will actually. I'd love to hear it. Um, is um is is this somebody that needs to listen as well or should we invite that particular character after the song we will do that oh but i think he's got a very angry message today too well he does actually should should, should i should i introduce before we sing the song because i yeah, think maybe, like to listen maybe, like, i think we'd have an like to hear it we'd have an audience here hello right. <laughs> hello <laughs> <Mr>. <laughs> What have you got on your coat today? Hawk <laughs> Putin. Whatever, whatever could he mean by that? Well, I have to his little Polish is, badge. You must have the uh, the letters somehow <laughs> have been reversed. What are you thinking <laughs> there, Paddington? And, and we love Paddington. Why do we love Paddington, Mary? Why do we love Paddington? Paddington. Paddington reminds us of the, our fearless leader, Zelensky in Ukraine, who in an earlier life was the voice of Paddington in the Ukrainian program. And he reminds us of how much all of our Ukrainian friends need a big Paddington bear hug right now. Yeah, we love President Zelensky, don't we? We think he is fantastic. What a brave man. What a brave, brave man and um you know so much we have so much to learn from his his presence on this planet so much to fight for um honesty loyalty country patriotism wonderful he's a wonderful example of a dignified human being who cares for his country and loves his land and yeah. anybody who has had to uh, witness their families uh, being uh, occupied by thieves and criminals because Russia, it, it, the Russian aggression is completely criminal. If somebody threw a brick into your window next door, you'd call the police and get them to arrest the person that through something you can't just go into someone's country and steal the land but um we we would just like to say slava ukraine and um this song passport um i made a music video on the internet and put lots and lots of wonderful um paddington's just going to sit there for me but lots and lots of wonderful volunteers and pictures of everybody who's been helping ukraine right from the beginning of the war including my friend dan Guz. um we had julia knight who makes music videos for beyonce and paul mccartney she she made it she put the montage together we had the wonderful people like yulia uh yefimenko who goes and sorts out drivers for ukraine we've all been pulling together and it's a wonderful um celebration of everybody who's been helping um to ease the situation of this horrific war and this song um, is called Passport. That's inspired retrospectively um, about the Polish people who lost their rights to have a Polish passport during the Second World War and after the Second World War. And now it's been a, become a horrific um, actual happening now um, for the people in Ukraine. So when I sing this song, 
I think about those poor people that are worried every day if they're going to live in a free Ukraine, they're going to have their own country. So this is my song, Passport. I've lost my passion to love finished the song now I had to just switch something is happening with the mute button so I just had to like so I just finished the song and the tears and the tears There's a line in that song that I love where you 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 say throw a pebble in the lake and so I just want to say um, I'm uh, so grateful to you for everything you do Katie for for 
you know, the little pebble, the little ripples that you're creating with your music and all the work that you're doing with the Ukrainian relief and the Ukrainian organizations. It's just all all so important and so so beautiful. It's a it's a it's a precious ripple. So thank you so much for all of that. Thank you, Mary. And thank you very much for 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 all the time and effort that you're doing with these wonderful episodes that we're putting together, because it is very difficult to talk about these topics. And a lot of it is, you know, trauma from our past. And um, so we're hoping that we can shed some light um, on a very, very dark topic and a brutal situation. Um, and we're yeah, sharing the next couple of weeks, we hope to talk about some of these uh, the other types of women who were involved, the other mighty girls, and how, what motivated them and brought them together. It's a really interesting story. I find, find it endlessly fascinating. We will we will be having four of these episodes dedicated to this topic. So this will be the next four episodes. So thank you very much for a wonderful session and a wonderful episode. And um, we'll see everybody um, next week for the next one. Next so time. have a have a Bye. wonderful week, everyone. Slava Ukraine. Puck Putin. <laughs> Puck Putin. Puck Putin. <laughs> right. See you later. Peace. Peace on earth. Peace.